So as promised, I'm going to get back to philosophy some some videos lately. Um, a while back, I made a uh, video response to Professor Anton, uh, where I, where I touched on uh, Graham Harmon's object-oriented ontology, which I'll sort of try to briefly go over. Um, so Harmon's uh, you know, whole uh, object-oriented philosophy is, ba is basically on based on um, Heidegger's analysis of tools, where t Heidegger talks about the ready to hand, the present at hand, and how uh, objects, um, you know exert this real force upon the world which is not simply a force for us but in but in fact is actually there's sort of the own there's sort of this background of things that allow us to uh, you know, to go by uh, and, and not even notice them uh, now the, the Heidegger's tool analysis is usually interpreted as you know, being about praxis over theory but of course, either any either practice or theory never really gets at the real object itself. The real object is always hidden from us um, at all times because we only know, we only ever see a certain profile of it, a certain uh, way that it is for us, and not and never the object itself. Um, and so, because that Harmon says that the objects recede from their relations, uh, the object is always more than its relations or or any of its possible relations because. It is uh, it has a certain essence that um, that determines how it relates to other objects, um, and it's also not just the uh, about the way the object is for us. It's the way objects relate to other objects. Any object only ever encounters a certain profile of another object, and doesn't encounter all of its qualities or uh, or or, abil or ability to relate in different ways. Um, and so, what Harmon is actually doing with this is actually. Uh, uh, He's first actually going against uh, Whitehead and Latour, but as well as basically a lot of other like post-Kantian philosophers. He's really getting back to the these ideas of essence and substance that have been uh, kind of uh, taboo basically since Kant, um, at least within uh, 20th century philosophy. So, um, so I mean, with with the important distinction that words uh, for for in the classical model of essence and substance, these things could be known to a person. A person could know what the essence of justice is, or the essence of uh, you know uh, of man, or, or anything like that. In in this model, uh, at the essence is always something that recedes from from you. It is never actually encountered directly. You only encounter its manifestations. Uh, and so, actually, I find this interesting from a theological perspective because. You know, mystics have always talked about the ineffability of God. That uh, you can never know God in, in itself. Only um, you can only only know God, th you know, indirectly through different manifestations. And um, and then language can never quite capture God's essence. And um, you know, a lot of atheists and skeptics have kind of been dismissive of this and saying, "Well, you're just dodging the question, and you're not actually you know willing to put your money where your mouth is." But what's interesting with uh, with Harmon's object oriented ontology is that this ineffability is actually true of the most trivial object. A fork is utterly ineffable. You uh, you only see it um, in in your practice of it in when you're viewing it, but but you don't know what the fork is in uh, in the other relations that it, that it can encounter. Um, and so uh, another aspect of his philosophy is uh, what's called vicarious causation. Uh, which is kind of occasionalism. It says two objects can never uh, directly uh, interact with each other except uh, within the space of a third object. And the third object can be actually be the relationship between the objects, but uh, but it's always an object into itself. Um, and there's also a buffering of the objects. So the, the two objects form a new object, but they're also distinctly their own objects as well that recede from each other within that third object. Um, and and through that they, and through that third object, they vicariously uh, affect each other from the inside out, um, you know, based on their internal central profiles and the way that they're able to interact with other things. Um, so uh, this that that last the vicarious causation part it took me a long time to get, and I probably the explanation I just gave probably doesn't uh, fully capture. Uh, the, the concept, and I, I'm going to actually link a, um, a, a an interview with Graham Harmon below that will hopefully clear up some of this. But anyway, 
Um, so object-oriented ontology has really caused me to rethink a lot of my views about um, about process philosophy and Whitehead and things like that. I, I used to be a you know very uh, convinced white Whiteheadian, um, and I've kind of questioned that kind of process relational ontology. But I'm not really to give it with. Uh, but, but although I don't quite adhere to process relational ontology the way that Whitehead does, um, I'm not really to dispense with process philosophy altogether. Uh, because what I find lacking, or at least sort of insufficient within uh, with object oriented ontology, is uh, creativity. And if there's someone, one sort of defining thing that uh, is central to process philosophy, it's that it takes creativity and novelty and emergence seriously. Now, I mean, object oriented ontology accounts for emergence, that two objects come together uh, within the space of a third object that becomes the emergent new, uh, new object. Um, which, by the way, I, th I actually think the Deleuzian concept of assemblage is a little bit less ambiguous than the word object there, but in any case, that's a semantic quibble. Um, what, what process philosophy sees about, about novelty and emergence is it rejects the simple causation from behind that a lot of philosophies have, where um, where there's a cause and where there's this chain of causation that inevitably leads to the next uh, state chain in that uh, in that stage in that chain of causation. Um, where so I mean, uh, Bergson used to sort of mock the way that we would always sort of Monday morning quarterback when it came to, came to uh, some event, like we would. Uh, look at the uh, chain of causes that preceded it, and then say that you know, based on those causes, that what happened was inevitable it was had to happen. Whereas uh, process philosophy says that no, those are all conditions for what happened, but the event is a reality unto itself um, that is not reducible to what preceded it. Um, and and so there is, uh, and so all all process philosophers have some sort of creative principle within them, uh, whether it's Bergson's Elan Vital, uh, or Whitehead's Concrescence, or uh, Deleuze's Body Without Organs. Um, what I like in Whitehead is uh, his concept of eternal objects, and that is that um, each education kind of prehends this, uh, you know, the set of eternal objects that ingress into the, into the world and affect each occasion. Um, what I like in that is, is that the sort of this insight that creativity is basically archetypal, that, that we uh, bring in these archetypes and move and uh, move forward, move toward them in uh, in our sort of creative advance, advances advances novelty. What I don't like about eternal objects is the eternal part. It's just that all these forms have just always existed, waiting for some occasion to prehend them. Um, and to me, what that does is actually. Uh, it, it takes creativity out of the virtual realm. It means that it, creativity is just sort of a transfer from the virtual into the actual realm. Uh, and, I, and I see a need for emergence in the virtual realm as well as the actual. And I see, and I see kind of two-way causation between them. Uh, and um, I see potential for that in uh, Rupert Sheldrake's concept of morphic resonance, that uh, every object or every, uh, every pattern that happens in the actual world um, for, creates a morphic field that, that influences future patterns um, based on self-similarity. And uh, as they as this pattern comes re repeated over and over, it becomes more it becomes a stronger field uh, and exerts itself you know, more non-locally across uh, across space time or across space anyway. Um, and so there's this kind of cosmic memory, you know, a field in which, uh, in which everything that happens in the actual world uh, creates, you know, helps uh, create this form in the virtual world, uh, world that can manifest in other forms in the actual. Um, and so in, in this way, there's this kind of um, two-way interaction between the virtual and the actual. And so I think uh, these morphic fields can actually act as the kind of eternal objects that uh, Whitehead is talking about. Um, but without being eternal, but as, as, as being forms that evolve themselves. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, Sheldrake talks about his morphic fields as, uh, in essentially conservative terms, that uh, 
you know, they create stability. Um, he, he says that he says himself that his theory doesn't account for novelty, which uh, will need to be explained by something else. Um, but I think that uh, this novelty can actually be accounted for largely through dialectics. Um, now, the Hegelian dialectic involves sort of internal contradiction of ideas that uh, you know that come into conflict and then create a new synthesis. Um, the Marxist dialectic involves material contradictions uh, on, on on the earth in terms of uh, systems that uh, collide with each other and have to give way. Um, I, I would actually uh, talk about a dialectic of objects. They're at simultaneously both both virtual and actual, uh, and the kind of this uh, constant back and forth between the two uh, realms, it, you know, become ends up uh, influencing developing development of these objects, and uh, it's to be con a uh, dialectic not just of um, contradiction but of contrasts. When an object fa finds some contrasting form. There's a tension that produces, uh, you know, sort of a, di a difference of intensity that that produces a, a novel synthesis, and so I think that with the, these novel synth syntheses that come about through the interactions of objects, uh, is how new forms come to being, and then it creates a wider diversity of forms which the object can then interact with again. So it's a, so these forms multiply upon themselves and create ever new forms that can uh, create greater possibilities. Um, and so I, I think that probably has a lot to do with the interaction. But I, but I think it seems to me that simply having objects in the world, sort of bumming into other objects, both physical objects and you know, for, you know forms of objects in the in the virtual world, um, doesn't quite uh, get at the kind of creative drive that uh, that I'm going to. So I think there needs to be some kind of unifying uh, drive for self transcendence that. That drives uh, forms to entities to seek out new forms and, and create them in the process. And uh, so, I mean, Whitehead in his later work referred to this as Eros, which his early work is basically kind of the work, the work that God does. But I think basically, I mean, you, you could you don't have to think of it in terms of theistic uh, concepts. Uh, for my part, I I like to think of it that way. But um, but, but the non-religious person doesn't have to. I I think, I think there's a kind of will for uh, for creativity that that underlies all all entities and that um, and that seeks out the you know the, the creation of new forms uh, th through this uh, dialectical process. So um, hope I was clear enough for that. Um, thanks for listening. Peace.